Support for Ben Franklin's World and the Doing History to the Revolution series comes from the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The Declaration of Independence stands first in a series of documents that founded the United States. It also stands as an early step in a long process of establishing a free, independent, and self-governing nation. Now, according to Thomas Jefferson, the American people had to issue a Declaration of Independence to convince the world of the justness of their rebellion. King and Parliament had forced American Whigs to seek redress for repeated violations of their sacred rights through arms. And by taking up arms against their sovereign, American Whigs stood outside the protection of both English and international law, a fact that King George III proclaimed in August 1775 when he declared that his subjects in diverse parts of our colonies and plantations in North America have at length proceeded to an open and avowed rebellion. Americans needed help waging their fight, yet official help from Great Britain's rivals, France, Spain, and the Netherlands, stood beyond their reach unless they could prove that their recourse to arms against Great Britain was just. Today we know the Declaration of Independence is a living document, one that we Americans turn to when we consider the values and purposes of our nation, and one that more than 100 nation states and freedom organizations have used as a model for their own declarations and proclamations of independence. The Declaration's important place in the hearts and minds of peoples around the world is precisely why we need to go behind its parchment and explore just how the Declaration of Independence came to be. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's world will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present-day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Kovart. The Second Continental Congress approved of the Declaration of Independence as we know it on July 4, 1776. However, work on the document actually began earlier on June 11, 1776. That's when Congress appointed a committee of five to draft a declaration for it to edit and debate as a whole body beginning on July 1st. The Declaration Committee consisted of Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, John Adams of Massachusetts, Benjamin Franklin of Pennsylvania, Roger Sherman of Connecticut, and Robert R. Livingston of New York. Now, historical documents reveal that a majority of the work for drafting a declaration for Congress fell to Thomas Jefferson. In turn, Jefferson asked for and received advice from both John Adams and Benjamin Franklin. So, how did Adams and Franklin inform Jefferson's initial draft? What ideas and phrases that we hold so dear did each of these men contribute to the Declaration of Independence? Danielle Allen is the director of the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics and the James Bryant Conant University professor at Harvard University. She's also the author of the book, Our Declaration, a reading of the Declaration of Independence in Defense for Equality, and a co-founder of the Declaration Resources Project, a digital project dedicated to creating innovative and informative resources about the Declaration of Independence. So, it seems like Danielle Allen is a really good person to start posing our questions to. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Danielle, we're trying to better understand the Declaration of Independence and how it came to be. Would you tell us about the purpose the Second Continental Congress meant the Declaration of Independence to serve? Well, it's important to recognize that it had several purposes. In the first instance, they needed to articulate to themselves their vision for what they were doing. So they needed to 
have a basis in argument for the idea that they could claim to be a sovereign entity on par with England and France and so forth. So partly it was a matter of bringing to completion the arguments they were having with themselves about the kind of community and political institutions they were forming. So that was one purpose. The second purpose, of course, was to announce to other nation states, particularly dominant in Europe, that a new nation state was coming into existence. They planned to seek treaties with France and Spain, and they needed a basis for the claim that they could seek treaties. So it had that perspective and that purpose that has to do with diplomacy. Then, of course, they also needed to rally support for a war effort. And so the first printing of the declaration was sent immediately to George Washington to distribute to all the troops, and he read it aloud and so forth. And of course, it circulated throughout the newspapers and the colonies, and it played a big role in rallying the support of ordinary colonists for this slightly wild-eyed project of declaring independence and fully embracing the cause of revolution. Why a document? Why do you think that the colonists and the rebellious 13 North American colonies felt that they needed a document to declare their independence from Great Britain? So they had their first debates about independence on June 7th when Richard Henry Lee brought a resolution for independence. The important thing to remember is that every time Congress proposed a resolution, particularly if it were a especially controversial or important one, they always drafted a preamble to provide the reasoning that supported their decision. That's basically what the declaration is. It's simply the reasoning to explain to several communities, several audiences, what the justification for this decision was. So when they were deliberating on June 7th about declaring independence, they already had in view three next steps that would be necessary should they indeed decide to take that step. One next step was that they would need a governing instrument, and so they set up a committee to write the Articles of Confederation. A second next step was that they would need treaties with France and Spain, and so they set up a committee to generate those treaties. And the third next step was exactly what I was just describing, that they would need a preamble explaining the reason they had taken this step. And so they set up a committee to provide that preamble, and that was the drafting committee for the Declaration of Independence. So in other words, it was part of standard practice. From your description, it sounds like declaring independence was a three-step process. Set up a government, form alliances, and tell other nations why you're setting up a government and forming alliances. There were definitely sort of three next steps that followed from the decision, though I would actually say that declaring independence itself was already part of a process. And so one of the things that's most interesting about the decision-making conversations that brought them to declaring independence is how much work they had already done on encouraging states to adopt constitutions for themselves. I love the detail in John Adams' to-do list from February 1776, where he's got, I don't know, some 20-odd items on his list of things that he wants to see happen in that new session of Congress. And the fourth item is that governments are to be assumed in every colony. And then the 14th item is declaration of independency. In other words, they first had to do the work of actually deciding what sort of new governments they wanted before they would be ready to declare independence. So step one was get states to write constitutions for themselves, which was happening already by June. By the time we reached July 4th, Virginia's done it, New Hampshire's done it, New Jersey's done it, and a handful of other states have also already written constitutions. Pennsylvania's in the middle of doing so. So that's sort of step one. And once they could envision a new set of institutions for themselves, then they were ready to declare independence. And then, yes, then there were three next steps that came from that. Articles of Confederation, treaties with France and Spain, and the text that could explain their decision, namely the Declaration of Independence. You mentioned John Adams, and he was one of the men that Congress appointed to serve on the committee to draft the Declaration of Independence. Would you tell us about the committee Adams served on, the committee to draft the Declaration? So they appointed these committees via election. So you you had to be elected to serve on these committees, and whoever got the most votes would end up as chair. John Adams and Richard Henry Lee from Virginia. So John Adams was from Massachusetts. Richard Henry Lee was from Virginia. They were partners. They brought North and South together, and they had been working together from the fall of 1775 to drive the colonies to independence. They were the ones, in some sense, who developed the strategy of driving states to adopt constitutions, then moving to independence. Richard Henry Lee is the person who brought the motion on June 7th to declare independence. So then in the wake of that debate about doing that, the decision to set up these three committees, they worked very hard on the politics of who would get elected to these committees. Adams was very busy. He served in many different capacities in Congress. He cared a lot about what would happen with this declaration committee, the preamble committee. He admired Jefferson's writing. Jefferson was young. He wasn't very busy. He wasn't on a lot of committees. He had the time to draft a document. 
So Adams worked the hustings in the sense of doing the sort of back behind the scenes politicking to drum up votes for Jefferson. So Jefferson won. He got the most votes for this committee by one. Adams came in second. And then the other three members of the committee were Benjamin Franklin, Roger Sherman, and Robert Livingston. So Franklin from Pennsylvania, Sherman from Connecticut, and Livingston from New York. That in itself is an interesting fact because it means that the five committee members with responsibility for this included four Northerners, so to speak, and one Southerner, Thomas Jefferson. And they did work, in fact, as a committee. So Jefferson wasn't a lone agent. He didn't draft the preamble sort of wholly on his own authority or based on his own ideas. The text emerged from conversations that he had with his fellow committee members. Lately, you've been studying John Adams' role in drafting the Declaration of Independence. And I wonder if you would tell us whether the Second Continental Congress elected Adams to serve on the Declaration Committee because he politicked for it or because Adams had some sort of unique set of qualifications for serving on the committee. Well, Adams and Lee were the two leaders of this effort, just well-acknowledged leaders of this effort. And so, I mean, when you ask about qualifications, I mean, I think you have to recognize that sort of leadership in itself is a qualification. That is, Adams and Lee had set up a strategic conversation. They had developed principles to articulate why the colony should be pursuing independence. Adams is the person who had been arguing for the language of happiness as the sole object of government. He had, in Massachusetts, already in January, drafted a text that has roughly the same structure as the Declaration of Independence. So I think it's sort of less a question of did he have specific qualifications that qualified him for this committee, and rather that he was simply the leader of this effort. And so electing him to this committee was merely a matter of confirming leadership that he was already enacting in his speeches, in his writing, and in the strategic politics he was pursuing. Now, years after the revolution, John Adams liked to recount how he encouraged and insisted that Thomas Jefferson draft the initial draft of the Declaration of Independence. However, Jefferson told a different story. He recounted how it was the Committee of Five as a whole that tasked him with the job. Danielle, would you tell us the real story of how Jefferson and not Adams, the leader of the movement for independence, came to draft the first draft of the Declaration of Independence? Well, it goes back to this issue of just how busy everybody was and what their different skills were. So, I mean, Adams was so busy. He was holding meetings at 9 p.m. and 10 p.m. in his quarters. And his colleague, Richard Henry Lee, with whom he partnered, and we have this one letter where on the bottom of it, Lee scrawled, I'm so busy, I scarcely know what I'm doing any longer. In contrast, you know, we have a letter from Jefferson on the fall of 1775 where he writes home to somebody and says, you know, I left myself all this time to write letters and do the business of Congress, but I find I have nothing to do. I have tons of time on my hands. And again, we have to remember, I mean, Jefferson was one of the youngest members of Congress. Adams was at least a decade older than Jefferson. And so, you know, you just think like if this is a committee of 56 people, there are some people who are already senior and they're leaders within the group. And one of the things that they do is look around for younger people to delegate tasks to. And that's really the structure of the relationship that Adams was delegating a task to Jefferson. He thought Jefferson could do it for a number of reasons. Jefferson was one of the best writers in Congress. This was clearly going to be an important document. So he stood out in that way. Again, he was younger. He had more time on his hands. Adams was serving on other committees at the same time. Jefferson wasn't. This was his one job. And then within the committee, you come back to the fact that, as I said, you know, these five committee members, four are Northerners and one is a Southerner. When you have that kind of structure, you sort of need to have the Southerner you know, drafting, writing the document, because otherwise you have a political setup where the South can claim, look, you know, we were dragooned by the Northerners and we just had this one token person on there who didn't even get to do anything. So, you know, this isn't really for us. We won't sign on to it. So by virtue of putting Jefferson in the chair for this committee, Adams reversed that political dynamic, generated a situation in which the South would have to accept that they had had a leading voice in the formulations. That's really interesting insight into how Jefferson came to pen the initial draft of the Declaration, because many scholars have said that it was really because Jefferson was already writing and thinking about the rights and liberties of Virginians, and that's what qualified him to author the initial draft. Yeah, no, again, I mean, I think he stood out as a good writer, but it was sort of writerly skills, I think, rather than that he had already worked out the arguments. So if you actually look at what Jefferson's been writing, what Adams has been writing, and what George Mason had been writing in the previous 18 months... Mason's and Adams' writings are a lot closer to the end result than Jefferson's writings were. So, for example, it's Adams who's driving the argument about happiness. Jefferson does not use that language or vocabulary until he comes to write the Declaration. 
when you look at the list of grievances, the sort of long central component, which is a list of complaints about the Quebec Act, that's Jefferson. That goes back to his summary view of the rights of British America. It's the sort of same list of complaints he had there. But if you look closely at the structure of the grievances, you'll notice that that you know, Jeffersonian stuff is like stuck in the middle of a different structure. And that different structure is a set of grievances organized according to constitutional theory, complaints about the legislative grievances first, then complaints about the judicial power, then complaints about the executive power. And then at the end, complaints about the law of war. And it was Adams, again, who was arguing about those three branches of government and how to think about them in relationship to each other. So I think actually the list of grievances does a good job of showing what the intellectual relationship was like between the two men. Adams was providing the overall structure and Jefferson was being asked to insert himself inside of that. You just noted that, like Jefferson, John Adams had written about ideas that appeared in the Declaration of Independence well before the Committee of Five met to draft the Declaration. Would you tell us about Adams's ideas and writings and what influence he and his work had on the Declaration of Independence? So there were two particularly important documents. One people have known about and paid attention to, and the other, astonishingly, they have not. The one that people have paid attention to is a pamphlet he published in April of 1776 called Some Thoughts on Government. And that's the one where he makes the fullest argument about happiness being the end of man as it is also the end of society and government. And so the fact that in the Declaration we had the language of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness instead of life, liberty, and property clearly reflects the intellectual influence of Adams over the course of the year. The other thing that he wrote that's really important is something that was passed in Massachusetts by, as they called it then, the General Court, which is their assembly. It's a proclamation from January 19th of 1776 which is a rough draft of the Declaration of Independence. It begins with exactly the same set of ideas. He starts the frailty of human nature through the course of life, having all ages and in every country impelled human beings, them here to form societies and establish governments. And that, you know, harks back to the language of course of human events in the opening and the notion that the Americans have been impelled to separate from Britain. And he carries along then to say the happiness of the people is the sole end of government and the consent of the people is the only foundation of it. And that tracks right onto the second sentence of the declaration that life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness are the core rights and that governments are constituted to secure those rights based on the consent of the people. And every step along the way in this proclamation from 1776 is a step taken in the Declaration of Independence as well. This was a document that Massachusetts generated. Again, Adams drafted it at the point when they were establishing new political institutions for themselves. So this was part of this project about constituting new governments for the states as a prelude to declaring independence. And Massachusetts had just rearranged their political institutions. And to support that rearrangement and to prepare the people for self-government, they decided to make this proclamation. And again, Adams drafted it. It's an extraordinary text. You can find it in Founders Online. But it's well worth reading because it is a draft of the Declaration of Independence. So did Jefferson read Adams's proclamation? I mean, how did Adams's ideas find their way into Jefferson's initial draft of the Declaration of Independence? We know that Jefferson read a lot of the material that had been produced in the months immediately preceding June of 1776 as he tried to synthesize the ideas and arguments that people were making about independence. So, for example, we know that he read George Mason's Declaration of Rights in Virginia. He described himself as having the job, more or less, of collating pre-existing arguments, not inventing his own. So I'm pretty confident, we don't know for a fact, but I'm pretty confident that he would have had Adams' proclamation. Adams was on the committee. The vocabulary of this proclamation shows up in the Declaration of Independence, you know, I think it's a pretty good wager that indeed Adams gave Jefferson a copy. Does the historical record reveal whether Adams had any hand in editing Jefferson's initial draft? Absolutely. Adams and Franklin both did. Sherman and Livingston were less involved. Some of the most important changes, for example, are that the creator, the word creator, was introduced in the edits that Adams and Franklin made on Jefferson's draft. And there were also key edits in some of the summary sentences that wrapped up the complaints against the king. So all along the way, they did make substantive edits to the document. So basically, Jefferson drafted something, he gave it to Adams and Franklin, they made edits, and then Sherman and Livingston looked at it as well. We don't have any evidence of their having made particular changes. And then the document went to Congress, which cut it by about 25% and added additional language relating to God, the language of the Supreme Judge at the end of the Declaration and Divine Providence. When Julian Boyd, a scholar from the middle of the 20th century, has done a fantastic job of tracing the stages of the text in a great book. I think it's just called The Evolution of the Declaration of Independence. 
It sounds like many of Adams's ideas made their way into the final draft of the Declaration of Independence. So what informed Adams's ideas about happiness, government, and the role government should play in ensuring the happiness of its population? That's a great question, and it's one I'd like to understand the answer to better. There's a terrific new book by Luke Mayville coming out on John Adams, which traces some of his intellectual thought and training and history. So he was a lawyer, so he had a very lawyerly approach to his intellectual life. Both he and Abigail were avid readers, so they were very well read in literature and philosophy. In some thoughts concerning government, where he makes the argument about happiness, he refers back both to the ancients, by whom he seems to mean Aristotle and possibly Cicero, and he refers to theologians. And so there were in the sort of both Puritanical and Unitarian tradition, divines, which is to say ministers who were theorizing concept of happiness. And Adam seems to have synthesized the tradition of what we call sort of eudaimonism from antiquity, where the focus is on human flourishing, human well-being, and a definition of happiness that connects to those concepts. He seems to have fused that ancient tradition with some of the traditions for thinking about happiness that were coming out of the religious conversations of his day. Do you think there's anything about Adams's influence on the Declaration that people just don't know about and we may find surprising? Obviously, I'm harping on this theme of happiness, but it's incredibly important because the pre-existing way of encapsulating basic rights was to invoke the concepts of life, liberty, and property. And indeed, that's the formulation that Jefferson himself used in the summary view of the rights of British America. Now, that leads to the question of how is it that happiness comes to displace property? And the short answer is that in the fall of 1775, Virginia's royal governor, Lord Dunmore, decreed that any slave who fought for the British would earn their freedom thereby. And this was a hugely important moment for two reasons. First, because it radicalized Virginians. So the Virginians were, sad to say, motivated to join the movement for independence in an effort to preserve slavery. But the other thing it did was mean that the Virginians started complaining about this act as a violation of their rights of property. So by the time we got to spring of 1776, when people invoked rights to property, there was attached to that idea a defense of slavery. So Adams didn't own slaves. He didn't think slavery was a good thing. The use of the happiness concept displaced that defense of slavery. So that moment in the Declaration is one actually that more or less encapsulated in an abolitionist position. I mean, it was a sort of compromise formulation because the Southerners could still understand themselves to be incorporated under the idea. And in fact, in George Mason's Declaration of Rights, he talks about four rights, life, liberty, acquiring and securing property, and pursuing happiness. So Mason, as a matter of compromise, had tried to take both the Southerners' commitment to property and the new language of happiness that was coming from the Northerners, from Adams. But then by the time we get to the Declaration, the property concept is extruded. And in fact, it was abolitionists who first made use of the Declaration for political purposes immediately. So Prince Hall, a free African-American in Massachusetts, used the language of the Declaration to put a petition to the Massachusetts Assembly to end slavery. And by 1780, you do have abolition of slavery in Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and Vermont, which was still an independent country, not a state, but still. So I think this abolitionist element of the Declaration is really overlooked. And it's an important part of the tradition and of Adams's influence that we need to recover. The history of the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. John Adams made important contributions to the Declaration of Independence. Like Jefferson, Adams had been thinking and writing about the ideas we read in the Declaration long before the Committee of Five ever met to draft the document. Now, according to Danielle's extensive study of the Declaration, John Adams influenced Thomas Jefferson's draft in two important ways. First, Adams wrote a proclamation for the state of Massachusetts in January 1776, the frailty of human nature. As Danielle described it, this proclamation is an early draft of the Declaration of Independence. And this early draft must have been welcomed and also a big help to Jefferson as he penned his draft. Second, In three letters between March and April 1776, Adams wrote his thoughts on government. These letters and thoughts later became a pamphlet, and this is where we can read Adams' fullest argument that happiness should be the end of man, and as such, the goal of government should be to secure man's happiness. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Not life, liberty, and the pursuit of property, 
Happiness is one of John Adams's major contributions to the ideas and language of the Declaration of Independence. So, if John Adams gave us happiness, what ideas and language did wordsmith Benjamin Franklin give us? The historical record reveals that, like Adams, Franklin also played a large role in helping Thomas Jefferson edit his initial draft of the Declaration. In 1743, Franklin helped to found the American Philosophical Society, an institution that would allow men to cultivate the finer arts and improve the common stock of knowledge. Unsurprisingly, the APS holds many papers related to both Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, including the letter that Jefferson sent Franklin asking for his editorial help. It seems like to find out more about Franklin and Jefferson's collaboration, and about the letter that Jefferson wrote to Franklin, we would do well to turn to Patrick Spiro, a historian of the Revolutionary Era and the American Philosophical Society's librarian. He has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance, unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained, and when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. Pat, we're trying to get behind the parchment, if you will, of the Declaration of Independence. Would you tell us why the Second Continental Congress elected Benjamin Franklin to serve on its committee to draft a Declaration of Independence? There's no hard evidence for why they chose Franklin or any of the other members for that matter. But I think we can suss out some of the reasons. One reason could be geographic balance. That's what a lot of historians have talked about. John Adams talked about the need for the various parts of America being properly represented in all these committees. So Franklin represented Pennsylvania, one of the largest colonies, the Keystone State. And then Franklin, of course, had seniority. But I think the real reason that Franklin was appointed was because he was Benjamin Franklin. He was the most eminent American at the time. He was well regarded by all parties. And most of all, he had wisdom. And having him part of the drafting of the Declaration of Independence kind of gave it a level of approval that would make it easier to pass and present to Congress. So when Franklin found himself elected to the Committee of Five, how did he react and how did he contribute to the work of the drafting committee? That's been a topic of some historical discussion because Franklin suffered from gout, which is a form of arthritis, basically. It's caused by an increased amount of uric acid in the blood. And so Franklin suffered from gout and it would create great pain. And one of the most common places for the pain to develop was in the big toe. You know, to us, it sounds minor, but in the 18th century, when you didn't have pain medication, when you didn't have ways to treat this, a flare-up of gout could really disable somebody. They would be bed-bound, they couldn't stand, the pain was constant, there's no way to relieve it. And so Franklin, during the committee's drafting, was suffering from gout. He was homebound. He eventually retired to a friend's house outside of Philadelphia to try and recover. And he was, for a period of this time, kind of unable to attend, most likely, the actual committee meetings. So Franklin was not an active participant in the committee in the sense of if it met, Franklin was there. But Jefferson reached out to him at least once, possibly twice, to get his advice on how the Declaration was shaping up. How did Thomas Jefferson reach out to Franklin? Did he go to Franklin's home or did he send Franklin a letter asking for his advice on his initial draft of the Declaration? It's something of a mystery that a lot of historians have tried to uncover and decipher. So there's a letter in the Benjamin Franklin Papers, which the American Philosophical Society Library has. There's a letter from Jefferson to Franklin that's undated. And it says something along the lines of, I have this paper that I want you to read. A committee has approved some small alterations, but I really want you to take a look at it and tell me what you think needs to be changed. But there's no date on it. And there's no clear reference to what the document Jefferson is sending is. And so the Thomas Jefferson Papers under the editor Julian Boyd spent a long time trying to figure out what this could be. And of course, they wanted it to be the Declaration of Independence. They looked at all the various committees that it could be referring to and all the various drafts that it could be referring to, and they realized it could be potentially five. It's also dated that it's a Friday morning. So they did this great kind of equation to figure out, well, which committees could this be? It's written on a Friday morning. It's a committee. Jefferson's on it. He's asking for Franklin's advice. Which ones could it be? And they came up with five different ones. The Declaration of Independence, that committee, the committee to write a declaration for the need to take up arms, an appeal to Hessians not to fight, a response to Lord North, and finally, the seal of the United States. Those were the five committees out of potential, I think, of like 29 committees that it could have been. These five are the only ones that made sense. And then they said, well, if you actually now look through it more precisely, 
it's almost certainly the Declaration of Independence that Jefferson is writing to Franklin. And so because of that, we know that Jefferson did reach out to Franklin concretely to ask him for input before the letter was submitted to Congress. We can't say with 100% certainty that that is it, but the evidence, if you read through the rationale, it almost certainly is. That's a lot of detective work. And as you listed all of those possible committees, it occurred to me that Franklin was really well qualified to provide Jefferson advice about the work of all of them. Franklin was the most senior of the revolutionaries at this point, and they looked to him for wisdom, for approval. It was important that he attended the Continental Congress. It was important, again, later in life that he was at the Constitutional Convention and was giving his tacit approval of the Constitution. And meanwhile, Franklin is also not just involved in national politics, but he's also involved in Pennsylvania state politics, where he's overseeing, during the Revolution, Pennsylvania's first radical constitution. Franklin's involved in that, while he's also managing all this stuff that's happening on a national level. Now, to go back to that letter that Jefferson wrote to Franklin, In that letter, Jefferson told Franklin something to the effect of, as you have an enlarged view of the subject. Now, thanks to the work of Julian Boyd, we're confident that Jefferson is talking about the Declaration of Independence. So, Pat, why do you think that Jefferson thought that Franklin had such an enlarged view of the subject of independence? Yeah, you know, there's two ways to interpret that phrase, and I think both could be correct. But one is that he has an enlarged view on the need and causes for declaring independence. And or he also has an enlarged view on the subject more generally of political theory and science and language and letters, because he has been a printer. He has been a pamphleteer. He founded the Library Company of Philadelphia because he wanted people to be more engaged with the letters and history and philosophy and government and the writing that's going on there. And of course, he also, having been in London, having been in Pennsylvania politics, had an enlarged view on all the various reasons the colonists should be declaring independence. So I think, you know, it's unclear exactly what he meant. And I like actually saying it could be either or because they both provide a window into Franklin and his influence and his life. We can't say for certain what he meant there. It could be either that, you know, Franklin had the best understanding for the need for independence because he had been in London. He had seen what was going on in London. He saw how those in the imperial capital viewed the colonists. It could also be that he was the most well-read of all the founders. Do you think Franklin's 16 years in London, when he worked as a colonial agent, impacted the advice he gave Jefferson and informed the ideas that appeared in the Declaration of Independence? I think one of the best interpretations of Franklin, and a number of historians have done it, but Gordon Wood is probably the most well-known for it, have argued that Franklin went through a process of Americanization in Great Britain as a colonial agent. When Franklin left Pennsylvania in 1764, he was going over there to try and have the crown assume control of Pennsylvania as a colony, to make it a royal governorship rather than controlled by the Penn family who controlled the governorship. And he aspired to potentially be the first royal governor of Pennsylvania. When we see one of the most famous works of art on Franklin done, it's in the 1760s, he is dressed as a British aristocrat. And it's in this experience in London that he begins to realize, first off, how many of those in the British you know, homeland view these colonies. And he also gets the sense of a difference between Americans and those in Great Britain. And so you see over the 1760s and 70s, the kind of Americanization of Benjamin Franklin. And he has this wonderful, and I think it's in a letter where he's observing the colonial arguments in the 1760s opposed to imperial policies. He's observing them from afar. And he's hearing the arguments in Great Britain for parliamentary supremacy. And he's reading the colonial arguments for the colonial legislatures to have independence. And he finally says, weighing these two arguments, I have to say, I am now coming down on the side of the colonies that they must be independent states, perhaps with a common crown or a monarch, but they cannot be legislated by parliament. And that's where he begins to see the need for independence, that it's almost inevitable. Earlier, you mentioned that Franklin participated in Pennsylvania politics and that he helped to draft the Pennsylvania state constitution. Was there anything about his experience with Pennsylvania politics that may have influenced his contributions to the Declaration of Independence? That's a really good question, one that I hadn't really thought about. I think in Pennsylvania, what Franklin realized more than anything was the need for a strong legislature. In Pennsylvania, what was happening in Pennsylvania on a small scale is what was actually happening in the imperial crisis writ large. Franklin saw the Pennsylvania governor, which was controlled by the Penn family, often was just a member of the Penn family or somebody they designated. He saw them as a tool of arbitrary power. 
that they were beholden to no one but themselves, and they pursued self-interest over the public good. And Franklin realized, as many others in Pennsylvania who were against the proprietors and the pens, that the legislature was the best body to represent the public good and the needs of the people. And so you see in the revolutionary Pennsylvania Constitution, a executive body that is very, very weak and an extraordinarily strong legislature. And so in some ways, what happened in Pennsylvania with the Penn family could be a story of what was happening for the empire at the same time writ large. Now that we have a good idea of Franklin's political experiences and how those experiences may have influenced his ideas about independence and governance, we need to ask the big question. When Franklin and Jefferson corresponded, what alterations or edits did Franklin suggest that Jefferson make to his initial draft of the Declaration? We know that Franklin made four, potentially five, changes. The way I would describe Franklin's changes are they're generally minor. Jefferson says they're kind of just small verbal changes or something along those lines. But if you put them all together, they all have something in common, which is Franklin was using more precise language. He was very much kind of, instead of using, you know, four words, you can use two and convey this message better. So what one example is Jefferson's original draft talked about the king sending over foreign mercenaries to deluge us in blood. So four words, very kind of emotional. Franklin changed it to simply destroy us, which I think is actually a little more powerful because it's so pointed and precise. Again, Jefferson had something that said the crown was reducing the colonists to arbitrary power. Franklin made it read absolute despotism. So again, I think that's a word change. It's relatively minor, but it makes the point stronger. And then the one that is somewhat debated is the phrase self-evident, because an earlier draft that Jefferson had, he had, they were sacred and undeniable rights. And it's thought by some that Franklin changed it to self-evident, which would again fit this general pattern of Franklin and the editorial changes he made. So how did Jefferson receive the editorial advice that Franklin gave him? For me, the great piece of advice that Franklin gave him was Jefferson always felt the changes that were made to his document, especially by Congress, just tore it apart. They destroyed the meaning. It destroyed the power. And Franklin shared with Jefferson this wonderful piece of advice. And it's the uh, story of John Thompson, who was a hatter. And this is, you know, just one of those great stories that Franklin may have created or may have been passed down to him. But it's very much the type of advice a newspaper man like Franklin would have. And it's a story of John Thompson, who's a hatter. He's trying to create a sign for his shop. He wanted to have a sign with a hat on it. And he wanted to say, John Thompson, hatter, makes and sells hats for ready money, which Thompson, the hatter, thought was exactly what he needed to convey. He sends it to all of his friends. And each one of his friends takes off a little part saying, this is unnecessary. This is unnecessary. So that finally, the final version was simply a hat with the name John Thompson underneath it with the idea being that that's all that a potential customer needs to see to know what is going on in that store. So here, Franklin is advising Jefferson that what he's experiencing, what he's feeling about having his words destroyed is actually the editorial process that everybody has to go through. Now, in addition to all the editorial advice that Franklin gave Jefferson, he also worked to provide Jefferson and all the other members of Congress with access to legal, political, and philosophical books and pamphlets that he thought would be useful for their work. Pat. Would you tell us about the works that Franklin imported for Congress's use? So Franklin founded the Library Company of Philadelphia in 1731 and then the American Philosophical Society in 1743. And these two institutions, which are still around today, really helped advance knowledge during the era of the American Revolution. So the Library Company was the premier library in Philadelphia and probably all of North America at the time. And it was housed above the Carpenters Company, where the First Continental Congress met. And so delegates were able to consult this library that Franklin had constructed. And the American Philosophical Society was a place in which people like John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, who are all members of it, could come to talk about issues, to learn about some of the most important things that are happening in the sciences and the humanities, again, to advance knowledge. And we know that when Franklin was in London, he would often send books back to Philadelphia, knowing that these were books that were important, that people in Great Britain were reading, and that the colonists should also have access to. Some scholars seem to think that Franklin's most important contribution was acquiring the book The Law of Nations by Swiss philosopher Emmer de Vatal. Do you think that this was the most important work Franklin acquired? And was it the most important work that members of the Committee of Five may have referenced? 
I think it's hard to point to any single work as the one that is most influencing the Declaration of Independence. I have to think personally that the greatest influence on the Declaration was John Locke. I think he had more of an influence on Jefferson and on a lot of the preamble sections that were talking about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and the theory of a contract between the governed and the governing. But again, I think there are a lot of different works that were all circulating. What I think might be most interesting is how widely read many of the members of Congress were and how they shared a common reading list, if you would. They all probably read generally the same works and therefore could speak the same language, which probably doesn't happen as much today because we have access to so much material that we don't share a kind of common reading list, if you will, a reading list of government. But they certainly in the 18th century were reading a lot of the same material and able to talk on similar terms. For quartering large bodies of armed troops among us, for protecting them by a mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent. Benjamin Franklin's election to the Declaration Drafting Committee lent the committee's work gravitas, even though Franklin likely didn't attend many committee meetings given his gout. Still, Franklin helped when he could. As Pat revealed, it seems likely that Franklin advised Thomas Jefferson to make four or five edits to his draft. The sum of Franklin's editorial advice? Use more precise language to cut down on words and to make your points more impactful. I mean, why say the Hessians will deluge us in blood when stating that they will destroy us will do? Franklin also influenced the Declaration by helping members of Congress think through their ideas about government and independent nations. Using his contacts in Europe, Franklin imported many books and pamphlets related to law, governance, and political philosophy, all for the use of Congress. So now we know how John Adams and Benjamin Franklin influenced the ideas and language of the Declaration of Independence. This means we're left with questions about the last of the proclamation's drafters, Thomas Jefferson, the man who set pen to paper and wrote the draft that everyone from Adams and Franklin to the entire body of Congress edited and shaped into the declaration we know today. We need a Jefferson expert. Peter Onuf is a Thomas Jefferson professor emeritus at the University of Virginia. He's the author and co-author of many books, many dedicated to understanding Thomas Jefferson and the Jeffersonian era. Plus, He's a founding and emeritus co-host of the weekly history podcast, Backstory. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. Peter, would you tell us the story of how Thomas Jefferson came to serve on the committee tasked with drafting a Declaration of Independence? Jefferson was known to be a good writer. He was the author of a summary view of the rights of British America, published anonymously in 1774, but it showed that he had a keen grasp on the issues of the day. He was an eloquent writer, and I think he was underemployed at the time, so there was a lot of work to be done, and he was a good writer. So I think that's the easy answer. Adams recommended him, then Franklin pushed on him as well. And, of course, we see in retrospect it was a great choice, though Jefferson had his misgivings at the time, given the way he was edited. It's interesting that you mentioned John Adams, because when we spoke with Danielle Allen, she noted that Adams campaigned to get Congress to elect Jefferson to the drafting committee. Do we know if Jefferson campaigned on his own behalf to get elected to the committee? I don't know that he did. And it would be unbecoming for him to push himself forward. He was a young man at the time. Now, before he served on the drafting committee for the Declaration, Jefferson served on many other congressional committees, including the committee to draft the Declaration for Taking Up Arms in 1775. Peter, would you tell us about this first declaration that Jefferson helped to draft? Basically, the war was going on, as you know, and the patriots had been called rebels, being put outside of the law with no protections under the international law of the day, the law of nations. So they were in a very ambiguous, anomalous situation. And the challenge was to explain what they were doing, not only to metropolitan officials, to the king, supposedly, and parliament, but also to make their case to the world. So you can see it's a kind of rehearsal for the Declaration, and it includes some of the very grievances that are later listed in the Declaration. But what I think is remarkable about it and about the whole movement for independence is it takes so long, because to fight a war 
that they know is a civil war, and that civil war is a nice word for what they're doing, that the patriots are rebels. And of course, they think, on the other hand, that they have righteous claims, that if a candid world, as Jefferson later puts in the Declaration, would simply listen, then the British would be, well, we can't say shamed into relenting, because that wasn't going to happen, and they knew it. But they were making a case, painfully, gradually, for what was going on already in Boston. The war was on, it had been on since Lexington and Concord in April, and here in July, it was issued on July 6th. It was past time to make that case. And that's what Jefferson had been famous for in his summary view and then in the Declaration of Taking Up Arms and later simultaneously with the Declaration and the Virginia Constitution for laying down the grievances. I think what comes as a surprise or an innovation later, of course, that we celebrate is the first couple of paragraphs of the Declaration that make a case on a higher theoretical level rather than simply listing all the terrible things that Parliament did, and that's the main thrust of the Declaration for Taking Up Arms, or the King had done, as in the Declaration of Independence. John Adams liked to say that he encouraged and insisted that Jefferson draft the Declaration of Independence. But Jefferson later stated that the Committee of Five tasked him with the job. Would you tell us how Jefferson came to be charged with drafting the first draft of the Declaration of Independence? Well, I don't think it was a big deal. Somebody had to do it, and everybody was busy. You know, Adams, who I think somewhat ruefully looked back on Jefferson's authorship and said, I should have done that, though he knew that Jefferson was a better writer. Adams was the so-called Atlas of Independence. He was a busy man at the time. So I don't think there's any great mystery to it. Jefferson was an able writer, as I've said, and he was available. Do we know what it was like for Jefferson to draft that initial draft of the Declaration of Independence? I mean, he had to draft it so quickly. So did he have a game plan for the information he wanted to include in his draft? I don't think it's that remarkable, Liz. I mean, given the fact that several earlier iterations were available, that is, in the various complaints that were made, the grievances, and as Rob Parkinson has shown in his wonderful book, The Common Cause, these complaints that then are listed in the Declaration are Well, the complaints of the day, this is the public sphere, the pre-revolutionary patriotic public sphere in which stories of atrocities and grievances circulate. The really important thing, I think, is that the revolution begins with mobilizations in the various states. The real challenge is to forge a more perfect union, as the expression goes. And I think what Jefferson had in mind, and I'm not crediting him with any genius here, this is what Congress had in mind was to somehow synthesize all the complaints in a compelling way that would make potential patriots, advocates of independence, recognize and identify with fellow patriots across provincial lines. The revolution begins in separate places. As we know, there is no America before the United States of America, no nation. There's just the British Empire. So the challenge is twofold. One, how do you extricate yourself from the British Empire? How do you justify that? And then how do you tie these fragments of empire together? If the colonies can't come together and mobilize around a common cause, then they're going to fail and they'll be sitting ducks. Their revolution will be very easy to destroy. This is one of the great fears that the Americans couldn't mobilize on a continental level. In fact, the very use of the word continental, continental army, continental congress, speaks to that sense of the bigness of their project and the need to find some kind of literal common ground. And that would be this ambitious notion that they're legislating for a continent, if not for mankind. Now, as you mentioned, Jefferson did have a lot of experience in laying out Americans' grievances with Great Britain, King, and Parliament. And he listed many of those grievances in his draft of the Declaration of Independence. So would you tell us about these grievances and what was behind them? Well, we can infer the logic of the compilation from reading through them in the order that he carefully chose that wasn't a random list. And one of the most notable things, of course, is that it's addressed to King George III and not to Parliament as the Declaration for Taking Up Arms was. And the first series of complaints really has to do with the ways in which the provincial constitutions have been, in effect, nullified 
by Crown policy or by Parliament. And that is what the Americans claimed was that all legislatures in the British Empire had an equal standing in relationship to the king. And this was the neat trick that Jefferson and fellow patriots had been trying to pull off, was to put pressure on the king to be a fair judge or an umpire, as Jefferson put it in the summary view. Even while the criticisms of what's being done by his officers, his ministers, and by parliament were mounting and creating this groundswell of opinion for independence. So this was the big challenge, is to make the claim that the colonial legislatures had an equal standing with parliament. Parliament had no right to tax. And it was up to the king to make a difference. So the series of grievances begins with a long list of how George III or his agents, that is, his royal governors, his viceroys, had prorogued assemblies, had moved the place of meeting for the Massachusetts Assembly and so forth. So that's the first bunch of lists. So then you have a series of claims about the people's rights to authorize governments of their own. This is to be the working out of the argument of the first two paragraphs where Jefferson talks about government by consent. What happens when a legislature exceeds its constitutional limits and, in effect, immobilizes American governments? They can't function anymore. Well, here's the fundamental idea, the one that Jefferson set up in the first couple of paragraphs, and that is power reverts to the people. That's the original source. This is, of course, that idea of popular sovereignty, an idea that had currency throughout the Western world, though no practical applications until the American Revolution. Then the next set of criticisms, the grievances have to do with the judiciary, how Americans can't get fair trials because of the admiralty court jurisdiction being established, common courts are being shut down. The Americans are being threatened with being sent to Britain for trials and their resistance. In other words, we're talking about a war and we're talking about the kind of penalties that Americans would be subject to when their own courts are no longer operating as they had traditionally under the authority of the king. So again, it's executive powers of the king, and then the judiciary, is, of course, comes within those executive powers. The brief reference thereafter, and this whole list of grievances that are really about parliament, but famously Jefferson doesn't say parliament. He's combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution. And that set of grievances, then, is the critical one. And here you can see many of the grievances that had been circulating in previous state papers from the summary view on are summarized here. And then there are a set of grievances that, are, roughly speaking, have to do with the savage, barbaric ways in which George III is using his power. The key thing to keep in mind here is that the relationship that Americans imagined with their king was kind of a covenant, kind of a contract in which the king offers protection in exchange for allegiance. But far from protecting his American subjects, he is subjecting them to a barbarous punishment. He's making war against them. So the argument being made basically here is that King George III has not adhered to civilized standards. He's reduced himself to a level of savagery. The importance of making such a claim is to project blame back on the king. So they make a big emphasis on their own civility, the fact that they observe norms. The balance of power might well be against the Americans. This is one of the reasons why the Declaration is so important in providing a kind of a fig leaf for enlisting foreign allies, notably the French, because the Americans clearly didn't have the material, the wealth, the power to do it alone. So building a coalition within the United States, uniting the colonies, the new states, uniting patriots across provincial boundaries, creating a credible presence in the world so that a bid for assistance could be made and that powers of the earth would recognize the United States. This was a tremendous challenge. So I think that pretty much covers the broad range of things. Everything imaginable that had shown up in newspapers that involved Native American attacks, that involved servile insurrections or Lord Dunmore's proclamation in November 1775 in Virginia inviting enslaved people to join the counter-revolution. The list went on and on of all these grievances. And of course, some are relatively trivial. Some are of course, compellingly important, but by putting them on the same page and the same list, 
And then working through the implications of them collectively creates this enormous impression of risk that we need to make our decision now, is what Jefferson and his colleagues are saying. And the moment has come, as I've suggested, the moment that was long overdue for a people at war to now go about claiming that they had the standing of an independent nation. Wow. It sounds like the colonists had a lot of grievances. And I guess they did, because the final version of the Declaration of Independence, which the Continental Congress edited as a group, lists 27 grievances. But I actually want us to talk about something interesting that you raised, which is that Jefferson and Congress addressed their declaration to King George III and not to Parliament, which seems strange because at the start of the revolution, protesters addressed all their grievances to Parliament. So why did they choose to address the declaration and its 27 grievances to King George III? There's a simple answer to that, Liz, and that is in the early complaints about British policy and responding to Parliament's acts when there's serious interference from the Sugar Act and the Stamp Act and so forth. The hope is that there will be recourse to the king and that the king will take the lead in correcting policy. Nobody wanted to blame King George III for the imperial crisis. It was his wicked ministers, it was parliamentary ministers, that he was getting bad advice and that the king could do no wrong. When we talk about the sovereign, King George III, we're talking about something that's more than the chief executive in the modern sense of the word. We're talking about somebody who has a kind of semi-divine, transcendent authority. Americans identify themselves as subjects of George III, so they're exceedingly reluctant to blame George, who, after all, fashioned himself as a patriot king. That is, he intended to be a modern king responsive to the needs of his people. This idea that the king would intervene on behalf of the Americans then justified attacks on parliament and on ministers who were controlling policy. It was one thing to mobilize against a parliamentary act like the Tea Act or earlier the Townsend Duties or the Stamp Act, because the Americans could claim then, no, we're not calling into question our connection with the crown, with the empire. We're just asserting our constitutional rights, because after all, there is a constitution for the empire as a whole, they claim. This is an absurd claim from the metropolitan perspective. So in the early phases of resistance and well up until 1776, it was de rigueur to exempt George III from charges. If you read the summary view that Jefferson wrote in 1774, it's clear he's right on the pivot between asking George III to intervene on behalf of his subjects in America against Parliament, and also speaking in a rather haughty voice to George III, coming close to commanding him to do right by the Americans. There's an implicit threat that Jefferson's making. And that threat mounts throughout, and that's in the Declaration for Taking Up Arms. That's what they say. They say, you know, we have sufficient force. We're going to be able to mobilize this, so don't think they're going to roll over easily. But as long as you didn't go after the king, then you kept alive the possibility of maintaining your place in the empire. The thing that's hard for us to get now is that Americans imagine themselves to be such good, loyal British subjects. This was not a matter of shame to be British. After all, it was the rights of Englishmen that Americans were supposedly defending against the British government. That's only when there is no hope for recourse that Americans very reluctantly turn against George III. And you could say that all the barrage of criticism directed only at George, with Parliament acting in cooperation with him, That suggests how hard it is to make the break. What Americans want is not that they're secretly conspiring for independence. That's what many British commentators thought. They wanted empire on their own terms. And the Declaration of Independence represents the reluctant realization that's not going to happen. You've mentioned that the Declaration of Independence contains a lot of ideas about government and the powers a government should have. So would you tell us what influenced Jefferson's views on government? Jefferson claimed in a famous letter he wrote to Henry Lee in 1825 that he didn't really write the Declaration at all. He was just channeling the American people. These were the ideas in circulation. That Rob Parkinson's book makes this clear that those ideas are just the talk of the town. That's what everybody's thinking about. The epitome or the potted version of social contract theory did not take 
close study by Jefferson. This was something that, in his estimation, was commonsensical. You could even say that the logic of events made Americans into social contract theorists because they had to start with the idea of a state of nature. They had to start somewhere, and when they drafted their constitutions, they had to do so as rights-bearing individuals who are voluntarily consenting to be governed. So there's no magic in this. There's no need to read Locke, though many people like Jefferson had read Locke. There was no reason to be a student of the Scottish Enlightenment, though Jefferson was. And probably more important to Jefferson with the Scottish Enlightenment is the hopeful gloss on the moral capacity, the civic capacity of Americans was certainly drawn by the teachings of the Scottish moral philosophers, that faith in the capacity of individuals to come together, to forge unions, as I suggested, a civic capacity. So that idea that we're not completely bereft if we don't have a king anymore, because we do have this capacity in ourselves. And we're not starting from scratch, in fact, because as I pointed out before, every colony has something that colonists consider to be a constitution. And if nothing else, they have the common law tradition, which has been in operation in all the American provinces since they were established. So Americans have a civic capacity. They don't have to invent something. They simply have to take common sense ideas and apply them. That's, of course, what Thomas Paine says in January 1776 in Common Sense. His big achievement there is to convince readers that the British actually don't have a constitution. It's just an unholy combination of of warring factions of the only democratic element of the British constitution is the commons. And of course, the commons don't really represent the people as a whole. It's a very limited oligarchy so that that emperor has no clothes. But while the British don't have a constitution, we all in America, he says, having recently arrived in Pennsylvania, we have generations of experience under our own constitutions. We have better constitutions than the British ever had. So my answer is, I don't think the political philosophers of the Enlightenment are particularly important. It was a period when ordinary folk could be enlightened, which is a quite remarkable claim. Once Jefferson considered all those popular ideas of government and finished drafting the first draft of the Declaration of Independence, he sent it to John Adams and Benjamin Franklin and asked them for their advice on it. Peter, would you tell us about the alterations that these men suggested Jefferson make to his draft? You know, Liz, I don't have the faintest idea. I don't know that anybody does. They weren't major changes. The changes that really upset Jefferson took place during the congressional editing phase. And as far as I know, we don't know who made those changes. Jefferson made some comments on the subject. He said that it was northern slave traders who didn't want that long section on how George III was responsible for the slave trade, where Jefferson makes this great statement against slavery and blames George III for depriving one people of their liberty, that is, enslaved Africans, at the expense of the lives of Americans by unleashing slave revolts and so forth. All of us today think that was an embarrassing passage, better left out. But Jefferson was convinced that it was strong medicine, too strong for not only the planters of South Carolina and Georgia, the new colony, but also for the slave traders of Connecticut and Massachusetts who had an interest in sustaining this nefarious traffic. Interesting. Would you tell us more about the edits that Congress made? Congress debated and edited Jefferson's draft into the Declaration of Independence we know today between July 2 and July 4, 1776. Well, about a quarter of Jefferson's verbiage, and in some cases it simply was verbiage, was excised, but there were some crucial passages. The most important one had to do with the slave trade, and as Jefferson puts it, George III has waged cruel war against human nature itself violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, and captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere. That's a terrible indictment, and it comes with ill grace, we would think, from a slaveholding Virginian who depended on enslaved labor for his very existence. But this idea of projecting all that was evil onto George III was maybe the capstone of Jefferson's indictment of despotic monarchy. And the old world had imposed this vicious institution on the new. It's as if Jefferson's suggesting there's something virtuous about the American continent itself, because it's not encrusted with the tyranny of generations of despotic rule. We don't have a real aristocracy here. And if we do have slavery, it's not our fault. 
It comes from the British slave traders and George III sponsoring the Royal African Company and the subsequent slave trade. So this was one of the bits that was excised, and so too was a long passage which congressmen thought would offend the British people having to do with the betrayal of the British people. I mean, the indictment of the king, it's not enough to go after the king and then implicitly after the others with whom he collaborated, that is with Parliament. But at the end of the day, as Americans were beginning to discover, as Benjamin Franklin had discovered in his interrogation in Parliament, British public opinion was hostile to the Americans. And this idea of being rejected by their metropolitan cousins or brothers was devastating for Americans. And what it entailed in this period was a sense that metropolitans, Britons at home, considered themselves superior to their American in-laws or cousins. And this sense of Creole inferiority and metropolitan superiority was crucial to the cultural dynamics of the revolution and underlay some of the concerns that Jefferson and others had about that idea of equality, because this is the thing that manifestly Americans could not claim or enjoy in the British Empire, and that is equal standing, equal status, recognition, respect. Independence was then the only answer. Jefferson complained that the changes that were made all weakened the force of the Declaration. They complicated what for him was a clear black and white choice that the American people were presenting to themselves and to the world of right against wrong, new world against old world, uh, liberty against despotism. And because Congress had too many timorous members who were unwilling to take that strong stand, Jefferson would later complain, well, that's why slavery remained a problem, because we didn't move at it then. It's a nice counterpoint to the complaint about Jefferson that they never did anything about slavery, and it's true. But he would say, right at the moment of founding, Congress should have taken a strong stand, taken the high ground on slavery, not simply made claims that all men are created equal, but followed through on it, recognizing the rights of enslaved Africans, if that seems at all possible. It's absurd for him to imagine that that's the case. But Jefferson had a genius for projecting responsibility for things that he found discomforting onto others. This is a prime example. And it's when he thought he was articulating the clear, strong, sharply defined position that would have paved the way toward progress, improvement, and enlightenment in America. And of course, that would have meant that Americans would have thrown over not just the British connection, but all of the archaic, anachronistic, old world institutions, including slavery and established churches that sustained tyranny in America and would be the source of the loss of liberty in the long run. Boy, it really sounds like Jefferson was more radical in his views than most members of Congress. And like Congress took the opportunity to moderate Jefferson's views in their edit of the Declaration. Do you think that's especially true of their views on slavery? Well, that was the idea that Jefferson had. The Declaration, after all, was designed to appeal to the candid world. And his fellow congressmen believed, and I think rightly, that this would be an embarrassing claim to make. Slavery, of course, is a terrible institution, and enlightened people were beginning to turn against it. But it wasn't something you could identify as the sole responsibility of the metropolis or even of slave traders. Americans were eager consumers of slaves as property. And so in a bid for public opinion, for public approval in the candid world, it probably behooved the Americans to avoid an extreme or radical claim that it was all British fault. No serious planter in the South was prepared to say, yeah, I'm going to follow through on this idea of equality and emancipate my slaves. It did happen to some extent in the Upper South particularly, and some slaves were freed, and that can be associated with the egalitarian language of the Declaration. But taking the clear-eyed, realistic view, slavery was already deeply entrenched in many ways. This is something we don't like to think about. The Declaration of Independence led to the further and deeper entrenchment of the institution of slavery, notwithstanding the talk in the first couple of paragraphs about equality. Slavery was foundational to the American economy, and it became more strongly entrenched outside of the British Empire than it possibly could have been or would have continued to be within the British Empire. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. 
a prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant, is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. In his May 8, 1825 letter to Henry Lee, Thomas Jefferson noted that the Declaration of Independence wasn't supposed to contain new principles or arguments never before thought of, but instead to place before mankind the common-sense subject of self-government, so plain and firm as to command their assent. He noted that the Declaration was really supposed to be an expression of the American mind at that time. Thomas Jefferson faced a two-part challenge when he sat down to write his initial draft of the Declaration. Offer a strong justification for the colony's departure from Great Britain and rally Americans around a common cause that would bind them together. Jefferson and Congress fulfilled these goals with the inclusion of 27 grievances against King George III. These grievances expressed many Americans' ideas that the king had violated his contract with them. In exchange for their loyalty, the British monarch was supposed to protect them, not just from enemies foreign and domestic, but also from the legislative overreach of Parliament. As the grievances relate, the king failed on numerous occasions to fulfill his duty to his American subjects. This meant that the Americans felt they had no other recourse but to declare their independence and establish a government that would protect them. Now, as Peter related, Congress debated and edited Jefferson's draft between July 2 and July 4, 1776, and Jefferson was not at all pleased with the edits Congress made. Congress cut approximately 25% of Jefferson's words, including his accusations that the king had been responsible for the institution of slavery in America. According to Jefferson, Southerners didn't like that passage, nor did Northern slave traders who insisted that Congress remove it from Jefferson's draft. So, does the fact that the Declaration of Independence helped to further entrench slavery in American society tarnish its ideas and legacy? What is the legacy of the Declaration of Independence anyway? I asked Danielle, Pat, and Peter this very question, and this is what they had to say. It's had multiple legacies, and one of the most important, however, is that it's anchored the concept of equality as one of the core ideals for our democracy. And I think its value has been in partly one of the instruments that excluded, marginalized, and oppressed peoples have used to drive revisions in the governing institutions of the country. So I gave the abolition example. Of course, at Seneca Falls, with the Seneca Falls Declaration, women rewrote the Declaration again as a part of the drive of building the suffragette movement and ultimately achieving the right to vote. Martin Luther King Jr. was able to tap into the Declaration as well to revive and strengthen and expand egalitarian commitments to civil rights in the 1960s. So I think as a constant reminder and requirement that the democracy of the U.S. is grounded on a proposition about human equality, the Declaration has been fundamental. I think the Declaration of Independence has probably done more to animate Americans to realize the principles that Jefferson put in there. We know that he said all men are created equal. He said that all had the right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. But we also know that those weren't realized completely in that time and are still being aspired to today. But I think those words are what have driven things like the women's rights movement, the civil rights movement, the rights for equality for all still today. It's the Declaration's legacy that still lives with us. Well, I think the most important one, Liz, is that the idea of the nation is first articulated in its modern sense. Nation is an ambiguous, multi-definitional term at that time, could refer to a people in any sense of the word, ethnic group, a race, but it becomes linked to the people's self-determination, the idea that the legitimacy of a nation is based on the sovereignty of the people. In a way, the Americans helped initiate the modern world, and of course, the French Revolution had a lot to do with that as well. But it begins with claims that Americans make to the candid world that they are a people with claims against the rest of the world with the right to their own form of government. And that idea of national self-determination it goes viral. It's contagious by the 21st century. So I'd say it's the great legacy of the Declaration of Independence is not democracy, but the idea that peoples have a right to govern themselves to determine their own destiny. Equality and self-determination. The Declaration of Independence embodies these principles and promises. The United States hasn't always lived up to them, especially to the promise of equality. However, it's the very words and ideas within the Declaration that have and do inspire us to act collectively from time to time to press for a more full realization of these promises. 
This is a legacy of the Declaration of Independence, and one that continues to inspire. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America in general Congress assembled appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions do in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Thank you for joining me for the last preview episode of the Doing History to the Revolution series. The series meant to explore not just what is the history of the American Revolution, but what are the histories of the American Revolution. The full series will begin on September 12, 2017. If you'd like more information about the series, the Declaration of Independence, or about any of the scholars we just spoke with, visit the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 141. Now, throughout this episode, you heard Jeff Brown of the Read to Lead podcast reenact a public reading of the Declaration of Independence. The Doing History team and I attempted to recreate a public reading because this was how many Americans, including many soldiers in the Continental Army, heard and learned about the Declaration. Now, unfortunately, we weren't able to intersperse Jeff's entire reading into this episode, but we have placed the entire uncut recording in the OI Reader app. Additionally, our friends at the American Philosophical Society and the Declaration Resources Project have provided many images, historical documents, and additional information about the Declaration so that you can explore more about its history. You'll also find these resources in the OI Reader app. To download the OI Reader for your favorite iOS or Android device, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash doinghistory. And if you don't have an Android device or iOS tablet, send me an email, liz at benfranklinsworld.com, and I'll do my best to get you these bonus materials. Support for Ben Franklin's World and the Doing History series comes from the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture. The OI made this episode and all of its bonus extras possible with its financial, technical, and historical support. Please be sure to thank them for their support by visiting benfranklinsworld.com slash doinghistory. This is where you can learn more about the series and about the great work of the Omohundro Institute. I'm also grateful for my Doing History team. The scholars and professionals who serve on this team are truly remarkable people. Thanks so much for your help with this episode, team. Finally, what do the ideas contained within the Declaration of Independence mean to you? I'd love to know, so send me an email, liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me, at Liz Covart, or post a comment in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.